not with the same structure. Christina Brown started recording. Okay, we are, I believe we are good to go now. I'll stand for All right. It. Going once, going twice. Can we all hear you? Just, just a thumbs up if we join. Whatever you're doing now, it's working. So, <laughs> okay, good. Uh, Chairman Dodd has asked me to run it, run the meeting tonight because he may have to drop out a little bit early, so I'll take the lead and drive. Um, first of all, apologies to those of you on Zoom. We've had significant technical challenges here, and apologize to all of you as well. For those of you in the public who may have to see this after the fact, uh, we apologize to you as well for not being able to dial in live tonight. So it's Wednesday, March 20th. This is the Airport Commission meeting. I'm Kevin Corkin, Vice Chair. I'm going to ask uh, Chairman Norlitz to, Chairman Wise, would you like to take the lead in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight? I'll, I'll put your hands. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you all. Adios. Paula, is the agenda posted? Yeah. We're going to do a roll call, please. Commissioner Fairman? Here. Commissioner Burke? Present. Present. Dada? Here. Delgado? Delgado? Hughes? Present. Park? Here. Hi? Here. Suero? Here. Wise? Here. Wiseman? Here. Young? Here. And Commissioner Michaelis, do we have you on Zoom? Yes. Commissioner Michaelis? Thank you. Okay. Changes need to be made to the agenda. We have a motion to accept the agenda, please. Oh. Who was that? Second. Oh, thank, you, thank you, Commissioner. Roll we'll call, please. Commissioner Behrman. Yes. Mark. Oprin. Yes. Dada. Here. Delgado. Hughes. Michaelis. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Park. Yes. Pod. Yes. Swirl? Yes. Wise? Yes. Weissman? Yes. Young? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> public comments. Are there any scheduled public speakers? Uh, we do not have any scheduled speakers for the general public comments period of the meeting. However, we do have some scheduled speakers for agenda item 7G uh, who are sitting uh, here with us today. So they will be called upon uh, during that discussion item. Awesome. Awesome. All right, let's approve the minutes for November 15th, uh, 2023. Before we approve the minutes uh, for the November 15th meeting, um, for those of you that were absent from the meeting, I just like to remind you that you can still vote on the minutes if you did not attend the meeting. Um, just so you know that if everyone who did not attend the meeting abstains from this vote, we will have to continue the minutes to the next meeting because we will not have a majority vote. Just so you know, you can vote as you wish, but just so you know ahead of time. All right, let's take a vote. Commissioner Barrowman? Yes. Burke? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Dada? Yes. Delgado? Hughes? Yes. Michaelis? Yes. Park? Yes. Pye? Yes. Swero? Yes. Wise? Yes. Weissman? Yes. Young? Yes. Motion passed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to item 7A, Master Plan, Airside, Contract, Alternatives Update. Uh, is there anyone scheduled for public comments on this? We do not have any scheduled public comments at this time. There is. is there anyone on Zoom that would like to make a public comment? If so, please raise your virtual hand. We do not have any. Public comments at this time. Are you going to drive this? I uh, will take this. So uh, I'll turn this over to Ryan and Stephanie with me in front in a minute. Um, but just to provide the commission with some context um, and the public, uh, we 
back in January, went to the city council to have the land side, well, excuse me, the terminal alternative approved for the master plan. If you recall the, uh, the city council voted on alternative 1A at that time. Uh, so we were moving forward with that development concept. One uh, caveat to that vote was that we look at consolidated well park facility in Conrad uh, to determine if the, if the location of that was appropriate. So we've asked Meet and Hunt to go back and revisit that, and they'll be talking about that tonight. Uh, but what we're focused on is the air side alternative now. So that includes everything inside the perimeter fence of the airport, including runways, taxiways, aprons, buildings, supporting facilities. A lot of that work was done um, with the internal staff. We did uh, revisit this or we did propose um, some alternatives to the working group, the master plan working group uh, about six weeks ago or so, maybe a little longer. Um, but from that, Meet and Hunt has come up with a conceptual development plan now for the entire airport. So they're going to be going through the airside alternatives just to outline where we've been and how we got to the decisions that we've made. Uh, and then we can uh, make some decisions after that. So I'll turn it over to Ryan and Stephanie to lead the charge. Great. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Harry. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. I'm getting an echo on my end, but um, Christina, would you like me to share the slideshow? Yes, please. Okay, can you all see the slides? We can. We can. Great. Well, thank you for having us tonight. It's a pleasure to um, it's it's been a, it's been our pleasure to work on this airport master plan, and it's our pleasure to share an update with you tonight. Uh, we we have, as Harry said, been working on airfield analysis as well as some land side analysis since our last meeting, uh, since we last briefed you all in December. So we're, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the the process for the master plan go through very, and then Stephanie's gonna go through quickly some of the requirements uh, that we've identified, as well as the alternatives uh, that we looked at. And then we'll share with you our recommendations for both the airfield and the land side components of the master plan. And then we'll uh, have obviously time for discussion and next steps. So just, just a reminder, this is the, process that we go through in an airport master plan. We break it into these four pillars of pre-planning, investigation, solutions, and implementation. Uh, we're essentially moving from the solutions phase into the implementation phase on the airfield and the land side uh, at this point in the process. So with that, I will turn it over to Stephanie to talk about facility requirements. Stephanie. Um, so before we really dive into the process of facility requirements, I'll just start um, with there's really two reasons that we would introduce a project. One of them, the first reason is related to capacity. So when we, we all, when we talked about the terminal projects um, and when we get into the land side projects, those are really tied to capacity. When we talk about airfield projects, we're really looking at meeting design standards. So Almost all of the proposed airfield, airfield projects are a result of meeting design standards. Um, so those are really the two reasons. Um, so the facility requirements process um, that we took is we started by having conversations with a number of different stakeholders at the airport. Um, and that's been a, a process that we've had throughout this entire master plan. The next step was to look at the existing airfield, look at current current Federal Aviation Administration design standards and make sure, sure those two are aligning. And then the third step is to take the forecasted activity um, and apply it to the existing conditions to determine the demand for things like aircraft hangers and aircraft um, parking apron. Next slide, please. So again, we've we've 
had a number of conversations with a variety of stakeholders, um, including airport staff, um, both of the fixed based operators or the FBOs at the airport. Um, we've talked to the airport traffic control tower um, and we've talked to a number of the tenants um, at the airport. Um, so here's kind of some of the highlights from those conversations that we had and I'll pick a few out to highlight even more. Um, the one thing that came up um, was the aircraft rescue and firefighting station is nearing the end of its useful life. So that's something that needs to be reconstructed in the future. So we've made sure to keep that in our mind and, and plan for a location for that. Um, we heard that one of the fixed space operators uh, needs an expansion to their fuel farm. We heard both of the fixed space operators say um, they would like to maximize aircraft parking. Um, we heard an interest in general aviation customs facility. And one thing that the tower brought up to us is that um, they would like the ability to operate some small jets, some mid-sized jets on the smaller runway, um, which would require um, an extension to that runway. Um, so the next step was to, again, uh, look at the airfield, look at the design standards and make sure that those are lining up. Um, just for everyone's knowledge, the latest design standards were released in March of 2022, so that was two years ago. So a very recent update. Um, and so we started our evaluation with the runways. Um, all the run, both of the runways meet design standards, um, except there is one non-standard condition um, on the southern end of the larger or the primary runway. Um, that design area is called the runway object free area. Um, and for a runway that serves commercial aircraft, such as the one at Palm Springs, that area is a rectangle, it's a large rectangular box. Um, and it's meant to protect the area surrounding the runway in case an aircraft were to veer off of the runway. So the non-standard condition at the airport is that, again, because this area is a really large rectangular box, there is an existing service road that falls just inside the edge of that runway object free area or the ROFA. So that's that's one thing that our primary runway alternatives are going to look to, to resolve. Um, and then again, with the release of these new standards, um, some of the taxiway geometry at the airport is outdated. Um, and again, that's just the direct result as the standards being updated two years ago. So we'll get into the alternatives. And some considerations just in general, what we're looking to do with um, primarily airfield alternatives, but also some land side alternatives. Number one, top of the list, meet the FAA design standards. Um, that's something that we have to do. Number two, we want to design the airfield to accommodate the critical aircraft. And the critical aircraft is the most demanding aircraft that has at least 500 operations. And then number three, we want to meet the needs and wants of the stakeholders to the extent possible. Hey, Stephanie, what's, the, what's a critical aircraft? So it's, it's the largest or the most demanding aircraft that the FAA's definition that regularly uses the airport, so that is have at least 500 annual operations. So at Springs, the critical aircraft is the Boeing, and Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but Boeing 737 MAX 9 is what? That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So getting into the primary runway alternatives, again, we're trying to solve this non-standard um, runway object free area um, with that service road falling just inside of that large rectangular box. Um, so we, uh, I'll just mention that the previous master plan um, also looked to resolve this. Um, and the recommendation from that master plan was to shorten the runway length. And we didn't wanna do that. So we considered three different alternatives. We'll get into those. 
So the first alternative, which is actually our recommendation, um, is to apply for something called a modification of standards. Um, so the airport would fill, fill out some paperwork submitted to the FAA. The FAA will review it, evaluate it, and they'll either approve or disapprove it. And this is a case by case basis. Um, I'll just put it out there that um, there are several airports across the country that have approved modification standards for service roads inside of runway object free areas. So um, again, it's up to the FAA, but there's probably a good chance that this gets approved. But again, it's, it's up to the FAA, it's a case by case basis. Um, if it is approved, the airport would reapply for this modification of standards every five years. And the reason that this is our preferred um, and recommended alternative is pretty much this quote from the FAA at the bottom of the slide. Why deviate from standards? Because it's a lower cost without sacrificing safety and efficiency. So that's really a key is that if it is approved, you're not sacrificing safety or efficiency. So it's approved the FAA is saying that this is a safe condition. And with the modification of standard, it does become, it's no longer a non-standard condition because you have a modification of standard. Alternative two, um, this was actually the least preferred alternative, so I'll kind of go through it quickly. Um, but basically what we did with this alternative is we, and I'll, I'll pause for a second and I'll say on the right hand side of the screen, um, that's the southern that's the southern end of the runway. So that's really where the um, non-standard condition is occurring. Um, so with this alternative, we take the runway and we shift it to the left or to the north. And by shifting the runway, we're shifting design surfaces because they surround the runway. Um, and by doing that, if you can see that orange dashed line, um, would make sure that that fell, would shift it enough to make sure that that yeah, that edge right there falls just right before that service road. Um, and if the road is not falling inside of that box, then there's no longer a non-standard condition. And then we'll go on to alternative three. So this is, this was the second preferred, and this is our long-term recommendation, because again, with the modification of standard, that's, you have to reapply every five years. This is a more permanent solution, um, but it doesn't have to happen in the near term. It can happen in the long term. Um, with this alternative, we're not touching the runway at all. Um, we're focusing on the service road because that is the actual issue, is that the service road is falling inside of the runway's object free area. Um, so with this alternative, we take that service road and we realign it, and we're showing that as a dashed outline, and we realign it so it falls outside of that orange box. But by doing that, because Kirk Douglas Way is pretty much right up against the airport's fence, we would also have to relocate and realign um, Kirk Douglas Way and relocate the intersection of Kirk Douglas and Ramon Road um, just to to give us enough space to realign that um, that service road. So those are the three um, primary runway alternatives. Um, going into the general aviation or the smaller runway alternatives. Um, again, what we're trying to do with these alternatives is we're trying to provide enough length to allow some of the smaller jets and mid-sized jets to operate on this runway. So we looked at three alternatives um, where we're providing about a thousand feet of additional runway length. Um, and the first alternative adds 1000 feet of pavement to the south end or the right hand side of this exhibit. Um, if you look at this apron that's just planned north of this runway extension, this is one of the FBOs or the fixed base operators. This is Atlantic Aviation's apron. Um, and you can see with this runway extension and taxiway extension, um, we're kind of building on their apron. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, 
maximizing aircraft parking is is really important for for both Atlantic and, and Signature. So um, this has a lot of impact to not only their aircraft parking but also the way that they circulate aircraft. So alternative two looks to minimize some of this um, impact. And alternative to, yeah. Hold on for a moment. We have a question. Okay. What does the yellow shaded area represent in these diagrams? Good question. The yellow shaded area is called the runway protection zone. So that's another design standard. Um, and the, basically, the, the purpose of that is to protect. This is a trapezoidal shape. It's two dimensional, um, and it protects people and things on the ground. Um, the FAA has been looking at the runway protection zones over the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years, and they've determined that if, you know, this is the, I guess, Ryan, would you call it the most dangerous place for? It's correct, Steph. The FAA has done studies that have, if an aircraft accident in the unlikely event of an aircraft accident, this is the place that will happen. And so we want to keep them clear on the ground of, of anything that would require a public assembly. So um, that's the goal of the RPZs. Yeah, that was a good that was a good question. Um, and I'll just Commissioner point out. Uh, one second, Commissioner Barron, you have a question? Uh, on either uh, 311 or 311 right alternatives, do any of them conflict with each other? Uh, where we, if we chose, uh, one was chosen, we have to not choose one or the other. That, that makes sense. Um, so is there conflict between uh, the, the two representative alternatives on both sides, right or left? Steph, I think I can answer that. I don't. I think they're completely independent. I don't think uh, either of the runway alter any of the runway alternatives uh, are conflict in any way. Good questions. Any other questions? All right. Um, if anyone has, has any other questions, please feel free to jump in. Um, so alternative two, um, again, we're looking at minimizing some of that impact on Atlantic's apron. Um, so in this alternative, we take 500 feet and split that on both of the ends. So 500 feet on the left or the north end of the runway, 500 feet on the south or the right end of the runway. Um, so obviously less of an impact, but still a pretty significant impact, especially if one of their goals is to maximize their aircraft parking. So alternative three, which is our preferred and recommended, only adds an extension to the right, um, sorry, to the left or the north end of the runway. Um, and you can see that we're showing 825 feet rather than 1,000 feet compared to the two previous alternatives. Um, and that's because if you see that dashed line um, on the left, that's the airport property line. Um, and just on the other side of the airport property, there's obviously um, a number of buildings there. So that's really our limiting factor or constraint on, on the amount of extension we can provide on the north, end, the north or the left end of this runway. Um, I'll also point out, um, if we go back to the right-hand side, back to Atlantic's apron, um, you'll see a bit of a taxiway reconfiguration and a green colored area, which is um, a painted island. Um, this, the airport had completed a hotspot study last year, um, and a hotspot is basically um, an area on the airfield that is at the higher risk of an aircraft incident occurring. Um, so the airport had completed the hotspot study and this is this was one of the recommendations that came out of that, that study. Um, and we also took all of the recommendations from the hotspot study and incorporated, incorporated them into our taxiway alternative, which 
will be uh, the next section. Good segue, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, and that kind of worked out nicely. <laughs> All right, and the taxiway, we have one alternative. Um, again, especially with the taxiways, um, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room for creativity. Because um, again, we are looking at standards and we're just looking to meet the standards. Um, so I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, really, the geometry changes are coming on these taxiway connectors. Um, and the connectors are connecting the parallel taxiways to the runways. Um, so you'll see this, the, the two leftmost taxiways have really wide expanses of pavement. Um, and that's a non-recommendation from the FAA. Um, so we're proposing painting green islands on there so that you know a, a, a pilot has a visual cue as to what part of the pavement they should be using when they're making these turns. Um, that relocated taxiway, um, this is again part of the, the hotspot study um, and that was another hotspot that was identified. So relocating it just you know, reduces that that risk of an incident occurring. A couple more geometry changes here. Um, a lot of them are related to um, apron to runway direct access. Um, so the FAA, actually it is a standard now. Um, it was a recommendation before, but it is a standard now that you can't have um, an aircraft come off an apron without making a turn onto a taxiway, um, just because pilots get confused as to what's the taxiway and what's the runway. So there's a lot of relocated taxiways shown here. Um, also, another now standard is that if um, if a taxiway exit isn't a high speed exit, then the connector needs to be 90 degrees. Um, so that's, again, really what we're doing with this taxiway alternative. And a um, couple more relocations. Um, and then there was another wide expanse of pavement on the very right hand side of, of this exhibit. So um, again, not terribly exciting, but we're just looking to meet FAA standards. All right, getting to into the general aviation alternatives. And this section really just focuses on our recommendations. Um, so we have two graphics on this slide. Um, the north portion of it is the signature recommendation. So that's, again, one of the fixed space operators. The, the bottom graphic is Atlantic Atlantic's recommendation. Um, so if we start back up on the top, um, I think everybody knows this. Harry mentioned it at the beginning that one of the CONRAC alternatives um, is proposed adjacent to the terminal expansion, um, which that alternative would displace and require signature to relocate. Um, however, regardless of the selected CONRAC alternative, um, we are recommending that Signature relocates anyways. Um, so we looked at a number of locations, both on the west side of the air airport and on the east side, and this is our recommendation. Um, I guess just for a little bit of orientation, um, there's Gina Tree is along that north side of the exhibit and then all the way to the left is Vista Chino um, just for some more. So we're looking at the northeast corner of the airport um, and we're providing um, the term FBO terminal, a new hangar, vehicle parking and um, a fuel farm so Signature can fuel their aircraft. Um, we're also you know, with emerging trends in the industry, providing a vertiport as well as uh, electric aircraft parking positions um, and a pretty 
large apron for um, just aircraft parking um, and circulation. Um, the bottom graphic, again, is Atlantic's uh, recommendation. Um, and what we're doing with Atlantic is we're looking to maximize aircraft parking. That's that's what they've been telling us. So um, everything proposed is on their existing leasehold. So we just added apron expansions to both ends of their apron. Um, and, you know, also are, are showing a vertiport as well as electric aircraft parking positions. So we're really trying to balance the two FBOs. So they're very, very similar. On this slide, um, we're looking at two different sites. On the left-hand side, um, again, just for orientation purposes, this is the west side of the airport. Alejo Road is that road just north of some of these green boxes. And then there's North Pacific Drive running north-south, just to the left of some of these green boxes. Um, and for both of these sites, we looked at different uses for what could be here. Um, and again, with airport staff um, and the working group, we um, are recommending that these are the uses for, for these areas. Um, and again, looking at the left-hand side, we're looking at uh, constructing some large hangars as well as aircraft parking apron in front of those hangars. Um, those hangars would displace the existing airport maintenance building and yard. So we're proposing that that just gets relocated and we've provided a pretty large bubble um, for them and all of their needs. Um, if they don't need all that space, that's great. Um, but we just wanna make sure that they have enough space for, for their operation. Um, we're, we're also including a flight kitchen, um, an expansion to the existing fuel farm, as well as fuel truck parking, which is shown in that rectangular gray box. Um, and then we're, again, just reserving some space for the existing fire department training area. Um, and then in that blue bubbled area that's labeled detention pond, that's an existing detention pond. So we're just labeling it as such. Um, and we understand that Alejo Road has some drainage issues, so we didn't want to um, interrupt that too much. So we left that as is. On the right hand side, uh, just for some orientation, um, Gene Autry is running along the right of this parcel. Um, this parcel is currently undeveloped. It's between the Palm Springs Air Museum as well as a tenant Sky West maintenance. Um, this is pretty much right in between existing Atlantic Aviation's apron as well as um, the recommended signature location, um, which makes it a great place to have a general aviation customs facility because both of the FBOs can have access to it. Um, and then we also wanted to maximize this area with large uh, aircraft hangars and aircraft apron. And so the, the section will just focus on, again, we'll do a summary of all the recommendations and we'll take a look at the conceptual development plan. So just a quick summary of everything that we've talked about. Primary, primary runway recommendations, number one, apply for a modification of standard and in the long term plan to relocate Kirk Douglas Way and the service road, um, general aviation, runway recommendation, plan for that extension to the north so we don't interrupt Atlantic Aviation's operation at all. Um, taxiways, just looking to correct hotspots, direct access issues, and other geometry issues. Um, for the fixed base operators, plan both on the east side, um, plan for that general aviation customs facility, and plan for the emerging trend of electric aircraft. Um, and then we didn't 
share any of the alternatives, um, but we, again, that aircraft rescue and firefighting facility or the ARF um, is nearing the end of its useful life. Um, the, and our recommendation is to, to rebuild it in its current location. Are there any questions for Ryan or Stephanie? I have a question. So what does this do to our timeline and crops? In terms of the timeline of the terminal development or? Yeah, total development. Uh, we're, so part of both meat and hunts and intervistus job is to look then into a plan where we can define a timeline for these projects. So um, we won't know that until they get through the work of doing that. I think meat and hunts already halfway through that actually, um, probably nearing completion. Um, but in terms of terminal development, I don't necessarily see them see there being a delay to our major objectives there. Uh, it's just a matter of working in the air side stuff as well. Yeah, and Harry, I, I would just add that obviously we're not going to do all these projects at once. Uh, one of the tasks of the master plan team is to make recommendations for when we do each of these projects. Um, and, and also how we're going to pay for them. So that's really the next step after today's meeting is uh, to put together a project list and put that project list in an order that makes sense. Next steps. Kevin, did you have I was just curious what is uh, the next to that GDA runway extension? Are those commercial buildings? On the north end? Yeah, that was the corner. Uh, I think there's a U-Haul there, and um, the AMR is there, and I forget what else is in that and there. It's industrial. Yeah, it's a lot of industrial stuff over there. Okay. Other questions? Next steps? So uh, as Harry mentioned, we're continuing to do the, the CONRAC planning that uh, we were tasked to do by city council. We're, we're looking essentially at a couple of offsite locations for a CONRAC, which obviously has advantages and disadvantages. One of the disadvantages being that we'd have to shuttle uh, car rental passengers to and from the terminal to the offsite CONRAC. Um, but, uh, we're, we're going to compare those alternatives to the on-site CONRAC and make a recommendation at some point. Um, but really what we need, what we need from the count from the uh, aviation commission is an approval of our, uh, of our air side and land side conceptual development plan. Everything we just showed you on these uh, slides. Uh, and then we're also planning an open house to share more of this information and also how we plan to pay for some of these. Uh, we're looking at early June right now is the tentative date. Uh, and then we also need to put all of this information on an airport layout plan that goes to the FAA for official approval. So are there any other comments or questions before we look for a motion to approve? I have a motion to approve. Perfect seconds in. Can we uh, say the motion is uh, to approve the master plan air side and land side conceptual development plan to be presented to city council? Okay, my commissioner for a second. Uh, thank you. Second um, is from Margaret Park. Margaret Park, I'm sorry, first was commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, take a vote. Uh, commissioner Merriman? Yes. Park? Yes. Reprint? Yes. Jada? Yes. So, Hughes? Yes. Michaelis? Yes. Commissioner Michaelis? Thank you. Park? Yes. Pye? Yes. Swero? Yes. Weiss? Yes. Weissman? Yes. Thank you. Young? Yes. Thank you. So, this passes. Hey, Brian, next question. On the Conrad updates, when will you be bringing that information to us? So I can answer that question. So because the council tasked us to go back with it, we were bringing it directly back to council for their approval. 
I don't understand that. What does that mean? So because the council gave us direction to go back and look at it, they basically the next step was to take those alternatives back directly to the council for them to see if we were on the right track and whether they approved it that night or not. That's kind of up to them. But it was basically intended to go to right directly back to council. Why, why would we be cut out of that process? We, we talked about Conrad for so long. Why wouldn't just be presented or shared with us before it goes to council? This is a big decision. I understand that is because the council directed us to move in that direction. If you would like us to bring it back to the commission, we can. That will delay the planning process for leaving high. I just think that that's you know, too much invested in this not to be a part of it somehow. When, when did you anticipate taking it to council? Uh, we are on the schedule or planning for May 9th. May 9th. So could we see it in our April meeting before it goes to city council? Sure. I'll be doing that. What's the date of that April meeting? 17th, I believe. 17th. Okay. Very good. That were a few right? Yes. I, I think we should have a recommendation by then and be able to show it to you. Yes. Great. Great, great, great. All right. Anything else on this? All right. 7B. Coachella Valley Economic Partnership, we transfer the lease agreements. Victoria, oh, do you have any other comments? We do not have any um, one scheduled uh, to speak on this matter. Does anyone here have a comment? Anyone on Teams? We're good. Thank you. Okay, Victoria. All right. Uh, good evening, members of the Airport Commission. My name is Victoria Carpenter, Airport Administration Manager at Palm Springs Airport. I wanted to provide the Commission an update on the transfer of the leases to the airport um, for the Coachella Valley Economic Partnerships. So um, I went ahead and uh, shared my screen up here. I'm trying to. Oh, here we go. There we go. Yes. 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 <laughs> So um, this is, I mean, it's a little blurry and I'm probably a little bit small here, but um, so this property is actually located south of East Alejo Road and east of, uh, I think that is El Cielo for a population. Oh, yeah. Oh, there, there. No, I was thinking Carol. Yeah, sorry. So right here where the yellow dot is, this is the, the property that um, is getting transferred back to the airport. Um, this is a little bit more of a close up of all of the properties that we have that are being transferred. Um, in 2017, the previous city administration negotiated a management agreement with Coachella Valley Economic Partnerships to sublease and manage the, the building here. And this land is actually on, or these buildings are on airport property. So, um, CEPA recently amended their agreement and um, they excluded this portion in their agreement. So now it's getting reverted back to the airport for the airport to manage the property. Um, as you see, there's about 12 different buildings here. Um, and in those 12 buildings is 12 different tenants that are um, actual small business owners. So um, staff is actually working with the city to get all of these leases transferred into an airport lease. And the tenants are gonna be on a month to month lease agreement um, paying the airport fair market value. We got an appraisal done on the property and fair market value was assessed. And um, we're coming up with um, individual amounts for the different spaces for the different buildings for the tenants. Um, this is about 42,000 uh, square feet that is going to be potentially released back to the existing tenants that are in place there. There is a non-aeronautical tenant in place on this aeronautical property. So the intent is for us to um, do the month to month, but with no longer of a term than January 2026. So the, the existing tenants that are in there are gonna have to make sure that they are able to find a new location and they will be working with the city to start working on a new location for them to um, move into by the end of their, their term. So uh, we think that it's adequate time for, for them to find a new location so that then we can turn around and use this for aeronautical purposes, which is 
the master plan does show that we do have intent there for putting some potential hangers there. We have had some interest with other airlines um, to have additional space. So there is use for this space here for the future. But we're working with the uh, small business owners for the time being to get them into a transition period since uh, CBEC, um, you know, stopped doing the lease management of those, those properties. So um, just to show you a few of the spaces here, it's the 12 buildings there. Um, I want to say at one point it used to belong to um, the school district. Yes, that's exactly. Yes. Um, and so these buildings, they're, they're a little bit old, um, but uh, we did have an inspector come through and took a look at the space and, and identified that they're still habitable, but more on just a temporary basis and, and nothing uh, too long for a year. So, um, so this is the uh, building there. I know it's a building 13, but there's only whole building. I don't know why it was number 13. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so that's, that's, you know, what we're doing here, we're transitioning, transitioning that over to the airport and um, the revenues for those, the, the lease um, will come over to the airport. So um, we're working on that. That's an addition that we're working on. With Josh, just wondering if any of their uh, leases increased in cost substantially between the handover from CBP to us. Um, so yes, so definitely did because um, previously, their um, leases were never increased in the past. So, um, if they were with um, Coachella Valley Economic Partnership for like seven years, whatever it was seven years ago was what they were paying to date. So, it, it has increased. And what kind of increases are we talking about? How much are we burdening on people? I don't have that information in front of me, but maybe next, next meeting or if there's any. What's the target reminder, reminder when they're going to be gone? Um, we, the termination date is January 2026. And how much notice have they had with this handover? Um, so, Victoria, I, I can step guys. in for that one. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, the, the, so I, the, the plan is to give them 60 days notice whether or not they want to continue with uh, a, a brand new lease with the city. Um, so it, they're, they're going to have 60 days to decide what they want to do and to, to negotiate a lease agreement. So it, it, it's a little bit of a different uh, uh, set of laws here since it is commercial space. So I think the law, you only have to give them 30 days notice. So we're, we're giving them 60 days to figure out what's going on here. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Any other questions? All good. All right, thank you. Let's move on to the year budget review, Victoria. Yeah. Do you have anybody wants to call the comments about this? We do not have any scheduled uh, public speakers. Does right. anyone have a comment? Okay. Victoria, go to work. So um, we, we have been, uh, the city as well as the airport took the mid-year financial performance to the city council on March the 14th, and we presented the, the performance of the airport. Um, so I just wanted to go over it uh, very briefly with everyone. This is through December. Um, and I, you know, I want to say that um, the, the council was, they, they appreciated that we brought this forward to them and um, we advised them that the airport use and lease agreement that we signed with the airlines, that was a newly negotiated lease agreement that took effect on July 1, 2024. So we had some different budgeting that we did this fiscal year that we've done previously and, and prior fiscal years. So, um, so I just wanna point that out to you as you see this budget. Um, also keep in mind that this is a roll-up of all four funds. So we have that customer facility charges, the passenger facility charges, the airport operation and maintenance, as well as the airport special capital projects. So that is complete, all rolled up into um, one, one sheet here. So um, one of the biggest pointers that you're going to see here is that we did our forecast through quarter four of uh, fiscal year 2024, and we compared that to our budget. So um, one of the biggest things that you're going to see on here is that there is a um, $56 million um, line item there for capital projects and federal grants. So um, we we bundled all of our capital projects in this fiscal year 2024 
um, budget. So we wanted to make sure that we were presenting to the airlines that these are all of the but these are all of the capital projects that we're requesting to do, um, and and it's going to be projects that we're going to be able to roll over into future fiscal years, depending on what stage we're at in this process. So we could be at a very beginning stage of where we're just we're doing the environmentals right now. So and and that may be a project cost of I don't know ten thousand dollars, but the overall project could be a project of $32 million. So um, we budgeted for that and we included that on our um, our fiscal year 2023-24 financials. Um, there is some good, um, there's positivity that we, last year when you look at our numbers, um, our revenues were about, um, our revenues had $12 million in CARES and ARPA funding. Those were one-time funding that we're no longer going to be receiving um, in this fiscal year or in the future fiscal years. So um, when you look at our um, actuals to prior year, you're going to see that there's a, there's a variance, but um, when you remove that $12 million of CARES and ARPA funding, you're going to um, still see that we are making our revenue about 9% over prior year. Um, and then we're anticipating our passenger traffic to increase about 3%. So um, the next slide shows in green, um, you'll see a historical trend for the last 10 years. You'll see this is our total passengers that we we started with. So if you look at fiscal year, oh, that's really small. Sorry, guys. So in fiscal year 2020 or 2014, we have 1.8 million passengers, and in fiscal year 2023, we had 3.2 million passengers, and we're anticipating to be at um, about 3.3 million for a fiscal year. So remember, from, from July or June year, this is not on a calendar year. Um, so we made this presentation to city council, as well as um, we we showed them our expenses. Um, and you'll see that right now we have of our budget, we achieved 30% of it. We're even forecasting that we would be at 30% of our budget. Um, and again, one of the biggest line items is that we have about 120 million, which is about 71% of our budget um, for capital expenses. So um, the major capital projects that we budgeted for was, was the check baggage inspection system, the design of it, um, the construction of it, and um, our inbound baggage claim design and construction, and our restroom capacity. Those were some really big ticket items that we had included in our capital projects. Um, the next slide shows just our charges for services that um, when you look at our audited financials, you'll see um, that, again, we, we still are forecasting um, our total operating revenues to be at a um, at a higher number than they were in fiscal year 23. So this is all of our uh, charges for services, like our passenger facility charges, our CFCs, I'm sorry, our PFCs, and then our airline public parking, retail rental cars, and any other charges that we had at the airport. Were you surprised the rental car numbers were? Yes, actually I was. Um, and they're just not trending as strong as they were in prior year because they were able to charge higher prices for their, their terms. Um, now I think it's starting to level out and they're starting to get more with industry standards of what other airports are doing as well. So, um, so yes. Um, okay, well that's, that concludes my presentation of the, the mid-year. Do you have anybody have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. All right, financial summary update. Do you have any public comments on the on the uh, mid year budget? Sorry, this is a new process for us to ask public comments every item, so bear with us. Anyone on Zoom would like to give a public comment at this time? Thank you, no public comments. Thank you, Christina. All right, you're tired. So, also included in your packet is the financial summary for the period ending uh, February 29, 2024. So um, I'm not going to go through all the numbers. I am going to say that we're still, um, to this date, we are still um, at a surplus for our, our net uh, operating balance um, on all our, of our accounts, if you were to put them all together. Um, I will say, though, that um, we're, we're at the end of February. We're 
currently in March. March is going to be our peak month. That's where we're going to see a lot of our revenues come in, and they're even going to trickle in for um, April. So some of our, our March numbers are going to be shown in April as well. Um, but we're still trending to be um, on the surplus, and so we're doing really well with the financials. But if anybody has any questions, I'll be able to answer. All good. Yeah, thank you for the packet. <clears throat> any commissioners on Zoom that have any questions? Great. Anyone in the on Zoom in the public that wishes to make a comment? Anyone in the room that wishes to give public comment? Thank you. Let's go to the marketing update. Uh, said that the E angle is out of town. Um, Todd, do you want to add anything? You know, I think it's it's a really short, um, basically lemonade where Daniel has put seats in comparison to your go. Um, so I'll just let that speak for itself. Y'all say that. Yeah, I'll say this. This is amazing. This is amazing. Um, I don't know where this idea came from. And when it all started, can you give us some background about how this all came together? It's really something. Sure. Um, that was the brainchild of Daniel. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were putting all good information out there um, for the airport and highlighting the things that we've done over the last year. This will continue year over year. Um, the idea being that as we work on things, we're communicating with the community while we're doing the business community as we did. Um, so that they know what opportunities they have at the airport. Jake, who was sitting behind me at some point. He's, he's listening to this again. again. Oh, okay, Jake took the lead on designing that. We did that all in-house. Um, so kudos to Jake for, for developing this. And we uh, distributed this via website and social media uh, just earlier this week. So, I'll just make a comment as someone who has read a lot of these and a professional career and read a lot of these and a professional most people are bored with these. And I just want to just compliment the team. It's the colors are great, it's bright, it's inviting, and it shares really great information. So well done. Thank you. I've been able to share it with a lot of folks who are candidates for commission positions. And so this is a you know, cheat sheet uh, getting up to speed on what's going on in the early world. So um, kudos to Daniel and uh, to Jake. This is really, really nice. Okay, let's move on to concession updates. Anybody? Have Any, anybody has any comments on this matter? <laughs> Anyone on Zoom? Thank you. Jeremy, tell us something good. All right. Well, uh, I think the concession schedule projected opening dates is in your packet there, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through all days unless you really want me to. But the first one, really, the high the highlight is Nine Cities, which. You know, we're in the final, final, final stages of that with inspections and coordinating the multiple different folks that need to be coordinated there. And so I think we're like, I, you know, although I have on there 329, uh, we're really kind of crossing our fingers for kind of Tuesday, Wednesday ish. But there's still health department inspections and city inspections and a lot of things that kind of have to all be aligned to, to, to make that happen. So um, any slips on any others? Uh, there have been some slips, yeah, a little bit. Um, hey, Josh and Las Palmas have been pretty good. Um, Cactus to Clouds has slipped a little bit. I think it's slipped a couple weeks to the end of May. Uh, that's a pretty uh, intense, complicated project there. There's a lot of coordination underneath the second floor there with TSA offices, United Airlines offices, and running breach trap lines and all kinds of things to make that um, that new bar happen. So there's, so it's a pretty complicated space. Um, and then Las Casuelas slipped a little bit in the, you know, mid June. Um, it's like a war zone now. <laughs> right now they, it's a, it's they, you know, they're pretty much, you know, taking up the, the concrete floors and walls and, and it's a pretty, it's a pretty intense uh, remodel down there. So, um, those are really the kind of the next two. Um, you know, that essentials has slipped. We reported on that before that that had to go through a slight redesign because they you know, ran into some structural walls that they were not expecting there, and that's an aqua caliente concourse. So, 
um, that date may still slip a little bit. I've kind of just plugged in a kind of a, a, a placeholder date. And then pink door, as you all know, is going to slip a little bit because we've changed that, you know, from a, a vending space into more of a retail or coffee. So that's, uh, I don't have a new schedule on that, but I, that's kind of a placeholder right now. So just be aware that those are called and we continue, we'll, we'll continue to kind of adjust along the way. So you should know the ad hoc committee on concessions um, just received an update on all the menus, proposed menus. So we'll be looking at those menus. We're trying to ensure that we have healthy items in all the different venues. So we may have an update to the commission at our next meeting, just to show you how these menus are evolving um, as the construction proceeds on with us. We've been doing a lot of other updates with parodies, Victoria and I and Nikki with trying to get more coffee signage and menu boards replaced and uh, kind of the list goes on. We we added a new, uh, if anybody's flown through in the last week, we've added a new uh, coffee kind of mobile coffee cart to, you know, uh, spruce it up a little bit in the courtyard and it can be moved wherever we need it. Um, so that's been a nice thing that Perry has put in place. With, the, um, with these record numbers of people, how are the lines? The lines are still there a little bit. Uh, Parodies has beefed up their staff. So they've, they've been hired about 12 people that we've been told. And then uh, MRG, who operates the retail uh, stores, they've added additional point of sale units to try to help with the line. So, uh, so we're we're kind of having a lot of conversations and discussions with them to try to figure out how to help where we can help. Still, our intent, if you guys are interested, is to go to nine cities after our April meeting down there and make sure that product is. Up to snow. All those beers. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Coming, it's coming along next. It's really, that's really nice space. Uh, and can I can I add one thing, Jeremy, about um, so Marshall Retail Group actually added uh, some vending machines. It wasn't originally in their proposal, but they added vending machines at our ground transportation center, um, which is the primary hub for all of the taxis. So um, it's they're just inside. A, they're inside. They're inside, and the taxi drivers have access to getting in. So that was one thing that they were asking for, and and MRG helped us out with that. So that was just an addition that they did. Other questions on concessions? Everybody on Zoom, all right? Thank you for the opportunity. Any public comments on this matter? Anyone on Zoom? <clears throat> no public comments. Thank you. All right. So wash facility on August. We have three speakers who are going to join us. Should we do those the public comments first? It's your time. Um, Jerry, give us an update first. Is that okay, guys? We get an update on where we are, and then we'll welcome your comments so that you have a more time. Jerry? Sure. So, since the last meeting, um, we have been still kind of coordinating with the enterprise. There's, you remember the last meeting reported that we had kind of a hole in the barrier wall, noise wall. Uh, at their car wash facility and, and product, we, we asked Enterprise that they could close up that, that hole and add an additional wall to see, you know, if there was any additional impact to the noise. Um, so we've been waiting for them to do that. That happened a couple of weeks ago. They completed that, put that in. The next step really after that was to recall out the code compliance um, folks to come out and retest the noise decibels. Uh, they started that a couple weeks ago. They've been kind of running into some um, issues there just because there's quite a bit of ambient noise in that area with trucks going by and other things. So they've been trying to get a, an exact uh, decibel reading of just that operation. So they've been struggling there with weather, wind, and all kinds of things that have issues with the noise detection equipment. But they but they have the day they finally were able to get a good capture of the noise and uh, we're still waiting for that for that data they were out yesterday for an hour or so and so we're waiting for that data to come back so we can figure out what the next step is to the request for the last meeting was uh, would ever enterprise reach out to their manufacturer to see if there's any new uh, design the manufacturers yeah. they can do so so we reached out to enterprise on that as well and they said they'd be willing to do that they were kind of waiting for this next step to happen first so um we're waiting for uh, to get the noise decibels the readings to determine kind of where we're where we stand and come if they're still in compliance or not or how that's working 
and then um, depending on how that happens, then we can use that as another thing we talk with the manufacturers. Anything else? That's about where we're standing. All right, let's go. Let's go to our neighbors who are living in this neighborhood. Give me about three minutes for each for I'll, public comment. I'll, I'll call them now. I'll, I'll, I'll call you. I'll give you three minutes, Mr. John Will. Will. I'm sorry, I want to let you realize that. Please, thank you. John, go for it. All right, so here at Home Run Noise, and I just wanted to start by clarifying a few details about the noise. Um, in terms of who's impacted, I think four houses have now testified at these meetings, and the neighborhood organization has also submitted a letter about this. Um, my guess is that I complain the most, but I live next to Enterprise, so that shouldn't be much of a surprise. Um, there's also very few full time residents in our portion of the neighborhood, so that's why uh, you're hearing the most. Um, I was going to say you might hear some comments tonight about the decibel measurements, but I continue to maintain that it's the nature of the noise. There's a high pitched whistling noise that we could hear in our house all day long. And um, I think someone at this commission meeting last month acknowledged that that could be quite annoying. Another issue is the persistence of the noise. We hear this from 8 a.m., sometimes earlier, 6 p.m., sometimes later. Um, if this were just a few times a day, I honestly would just shrug my shoulders and move on. Um, but there's a huge difference between hearing this just for a few minutes versus hearing it all day long. And we hear it hundreds of times a day. Um, I've actually counted. So I, I was going to acknowledge the, uh, the, the recent nation of noise barrier was put in. We still hear the noise. We heard it today on the way over. So again, I want to be forward looking about solutions. Um, someone on the commission made a very sensible recommendation about getting in touch with the manufacturer about the noise and what could be done about it. And that's something that could take an hour and we don't have an update. So I, I hope that the next meeting that we could get the name of the manufacturer and the model of the equipment and what, what the manufacturer said. You know, it's, what, what could be done to evade it. Um, so finally, I, I made the point a few times that getting a qualified noise engineer to advise on the matter would make the most sense. I'm even offered to pay for this. So I, I hope that's part of the picture. Um, and yeah, just our end game really is to get back to where we were in September and for years prior, which was we like our business in some more, and the airport does its business, and we, we peacefully coexist um, without a source. So, so thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, now we have uh, Mr. Christopher Campbell, please. Yeah, I don't have much to say because I was hoping the other day we would have a little bit more information. So, we will be at the next meeting and look forward because this is not a one person issue, it's an every issue. So I hope that the next meeting we're able to make some progress. Thank you, Mr. Kaplan. Thanks for having me. John has said as well. Um, I'm his partner, and we live together, and the noise is so annoying. Day after day after day, we can't have our windows open, can't have our doors open. It's just got to stop. Thank you, Mr. Portado. Um, thank you for all the comments. Um, we're going to stay on this. I know that, um, uh, Jeremy, there was the big ask was the manufacturer in our last meeting. And so we would really like to understand uh, what the perspective is. Um, yes, let's get another noise level. Um, but even if it's close, I think it's time to look at some other issues, some other solutions as well. Um, we talked about trees. We've talked about other, other natural barriers that may work here. Um, can we have some some time devoted to looking at some of those other options as well, just to see if we can find more than just the noise level is within limits and the manufacturer says it's doing this supposed to do. Um, yeah. You and I went over there to listen to it. I encourage other commissioners to listen to it. Um, if once you hear this noise, you know it's really hard not to hear. So I just want to see if there's more we can do, and if we can have the information for our next meeting. And before we move on, if there's anyone uh, on Zoom that wishes to speak.
that, that, are there any public comments uh, uh, for any of the people on Zoom that want, want to speak, or are we good? <laughs> Looks like we're good. Yeah. So this will be on our agenda next month. I know we'll come back to it. We'll see the dish. Right. Thank, thanks for being here. I appreciate sure. it. So Thank you. All right. Public art. Okay, this is my item. So um, the, the operations committee may recall that um, there was a point where the arts commission had come out, taken a look around the airport, and wanted to make proposals on various uh, various areas where they could install public art. Uh, and the first part of that was a mural uh, between the Wexler building and the uh, Abu Khalid and High Force along the bridge. Uh, there's a building on the west side of the bridge uh, where typically we have employee restrooms and a nursing room. Um, we're looking at public art in that location. So we've included the artwork that was proposed by the Arts Commission, actually approved by the Arts Commission in your packet. Um, I'm wondering if you can, can put it on the Zoom. So I can share it. Can okay. share it? Or just gonna share it here. Okay. And this is the area I'm referring to, um, the building uh, leading to the Amokalente Concourse, and we would put murals along that wall uh, to cover up a little bit of the unsightliness. Um, and then we can try to scroll down to the after. And that is what has been approved and is being proposed for this commission to consider today. So I believe online we've got the artists. Um, we have Commissioners Ramirez and Armstrong from the Arts Commission. Commissioner and Ramirez. And Artist Logan is on. And Artist Logan and Jay Verrado with our uh, with City Hall. Um, and I'm wondering if any of you all would like to speak to um, the thoughts behind this mural, how we got here, and make your pitch. Sure. Uh, so uh, I'll go. I'm the I'm the chair of the commission, Gary Armstrong, and I think I've spoken to you in various formations over the past year and a half. Um, the intent for this was to put something up that could be viewed as temporary art, knowing that the airport expansion was happening, and that our main goal is to re reassign, refurbish the existing uh, permanent collection artwork that's in the airport right now. Uh, doing a mural like this would be sort of a quick fix to get something done. And so what was pitched was sort of the welcome, Palm Springs welcomes you or welcome to Palm Springs message. Uh, that's what was approved by Palm Springs City Council. And then we did a call for artists and the call for artists, um, we got multiple submissions. The Art Commission reviewed them and this was the one they chose. Uh, the, the art, as I said, the artist is here. He has a very painterly um, sort of impressionistic style. So it will not look like an ad. It will not look, you know, like advertising. It will look very human. Um, and I think you can see that. And this is in, this is strictly a mock-up. This is not the final thing that's going to be scanned and blown up. He will come on site and actually paint it on the wall. And so it will be, as I said, very impressionistic. Um, and we think it's it, it'll be great. And, and it will be the sort of thing that will be very uh, Instagram friendly. We think it's, you know, again, it's where people walk back and forth and they will stop and take pictures of it. Um, and as I think I mentioned to you when I spoke to you last, the one thing that we noticed when we did our audit of your artwork is none of it is inviting in its current location. None of it says, take a picture of this. None of it says, I want you to snap a picture of something that's memorable for the Palm Springs Airport. So um, the most Instagram piece in the public art collection is popsicles, and it is just bright and fun, and people stand in front of it and take a picture. Um, Marilyn, of course, is very Instagrammable. She's not technically part of the public art collection, but we find that things that are bright and engaging, people will take pictures of. So that, that's the intent. And, and if you recall in the original proposal, this was meant to be redone and redesigned annually. And then we would get an artist from a different one of the greater Palm Springs area cities to submit a mural idea. So. This one is from Palm Springs. Maybe the next one would be from Desert Hot Springs or Indio and just keep that going. Um, one of our major goals with the Arts Commission is to show that this, the, the greater Palm Springs area cultivates artists and we're very artist friendly. So that's the overriding message here. Commissioner Ramirez, do you have anything else you want to add? 
Um, yes. First of all, thank you, Gary, and thank you, Commissioner, for having us here tonight. Um, I just wanted to read a little bit of um, a headline for this piece. Um, it's in the packet as well, but uh, just as an overall statement. So the Palm Springs welcomes you, um, welcoming all with open arms. Vibrant New York, Palm Springs International Airport is a warm and inviting testament to the multicultural essence and vitality of our greater Palm Springs. Partnership with PSP and crafted by local artist Logan, who we have the pleasure of having him online tonight. Um, this artwork extends a bold and colorful greeting to all travelers with the words Palm Springs welcomes you. I'm infused with the spirit of the community. You can see a lot of the uh, kind of themes here that I think we all kind of know and love about this destination from the San Jacinto Mountains. Um, we have trees, the oasis, um, hiking, peak sunrises and sunsets. Um, the social culture, mid-century modern home, design, airplane, awesome and fun. Um, so to reiterate what Gary said, um, we went through a great process and uh, yeah, we're excited to hear your thoughts on this piece, but also, um, yeah, we think it's going to be a really Instagrammable piece. It's going to be a personal piece and a very colorful and vibrant piece um, for the thousands of travelers going through each day of this concourse. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Comments, commissioners. Let's do it here first. Then we'll run to some. You know, any comments? We we just I just got to talk about how much I love the colorful plays, uh, playfulness of the annual reporter. That's also captured in this. I I love every aspect of this. One hundred percent. Awesome. Thank you, Todd. The others. Great. Echo the same. Uh, one thing I would add is maybe. While we're here to find the wall, we can also work on the floor. I like the idea of other cities being able to participate in this. I mean, it may be five or six years before I get a turn. That's a great idea. Other comments? Uh, Zoom. Commissioners on Zoom, any comments? Okay, I, I just want to um, just cl clean things up here at the end, and that the process will be, if the, if your commission approves this, it then needs to go for a public hearing, which will be uh, held through the Arts Commission, where we have to host it for all public comment. It then goes to City Council for their final approval, and at that point, then the artist can start uh, implementation. Awesome. Yes. Um, here, this is, I think this is fabulous. Um, it's a first step. Um, let's vote on this. And then let's have some other comments about our next steps with the art commission. Can we do that? Yeah. All right. I'd like to have a motion, please, to approve. Do we have a formal public comment first? Oh. Anyone has any other? We already did the public comments. I'm sorry. <laughs> any other any additional public comments on this item? Anyone on Zoom? No public comments. Thank you. Okay, so here's the topic. We'll be talking. Then we do public yes. comments. Yes. <laughs> we'll get there. All right. Second motion, second, we're good. Let's go to a vote, please. And then stick, stick around here. You want to chat with me about something else? Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Behrman? Yes. Burke? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Dada? Oh. Dope Hughes? Yes. Michaelis? Yes. Commissioner Park? Yes. Pye? Yes. Suero? Yes. Wise? Yes. Wiseman? Yes. Young? Yes. Thank you. Here, congratulations. Thank you for this first step. Now the question is, all the other things we talked about during the tour um, several months ago, you know, uh, combining all those statues and putting them in front of what the mural would be, lighting for those statues, um, additional yep. artwork for the ticketing area, um, even if it's temporary and it uh, rotates. Um, yep. Is there any progress on those other things that can help us fill in these empty spaces between now and when our construction stops? Yes, um, I believe our staff liaison, Jay Verada, who's here, has asked somebody at the airport, we need a, a formal layout for the uh, walkway area. And our other key co question is any weight restrictions. Because as we move this artwork around and need to create pedestals for it, we need to ensure we're not doing anything that is damaging below. So once we get all that, we will be submitting the formal plan to create this art, art walkway and move things around and then we can go from there to fill in the other spots but we want to we need to take care of the existing artwork first because some of it's still continuing to be damaged 
So, commissioners, we don't have this as an actual item on our agenda for this evening. Yeah. Um, so we yep. can bring this back. Yeah. To, for a full discussion once we have sure. it listed on the yep. agenda. Yeah. Thank you. I, I was just answering his question. We need, we need some more information from the airport to move forward on some of the pieces. So we'll put it in that next month. Yes, sir. And Jeremy, can we get the information they need? Basically, it's already on the <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, everyone has it? I'll take care of it. Yeah, okay. All right. And we'll put on the, uh, and invite you back next month with yeah. the information and see what our next steps are. And and uh, thank you again. And I just want to say, just because we feel we know we need to be working so closely with you, we made the uh, the motion and we've shifted the time of the Arts Commission meeting so we do not overlap with the Airport Commission meeting. And that way we can have people here to discuss these items. Thank you. Keep it coming, please. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes. Uh, Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, TNC signage area. All right, TNC signage. This is, um, we're proposing approval of an ordinance amendment uh, based on um, some recommendations and requests by uh, the commissioners here. Um, and that removes the signage at the curbside where the TNC area is, the rear left area staging is. Currently there's signage there that indicates that um, doesn't indicate it outright says um, that Uber and Lyft drivers don't aren't subject to background checks, um, aren't subject to drug testing or alcohol testing, and it's meant to discourage um, Uber and Lyft drivers from operating at the airport. Uh, this was the history of this. This came about maybe 2014 or so um, when Uber and Lyft was just emerging, trying to enter the market, and taxis and TNCs were. Uh, at battle, um, and so this was part of the requirement for Green Lift to operate at the airport, uh, was that Palm Springs would install signage and it was into a bit. And I don't know if Jeremy, if you want to add anything to that or. Uh, no, not really. Other than the fact that, you know, it's a really simple ordinance. It just removes the, the requirements that stated in the municipal code that there had to be a sign present that said all the things that Harry <laughs> said was located on it. So it's pretty simple, though, overall. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So the draft ordinance is in your packet. Um, are there any questions? And if not, we would propose a vote on it. Any questions before we see if there's public questions? Any other comments? Everybody understand what we're putting Are any public comments? No public comments? All right. Anyone on Zoom that has any public comments? We have no public comments. All right. So we need a motion to recommend ordinance amending TNC signage to the city council. Great motion. Second. All right, no, Thank Let's you. Let's go for a vote, please. Uh, Commissioner Behrman? Yes. Burke? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Hughes? Yes. Michaelis? Yes. Park? Yes. Pye? Yes. Swero? Yes. Wise? Yes. Weissman? Yes. Young? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, for bringing that up. Absolutely. All right, 7J, no smoking policy. Harry, there is no document for the no smoking policy. This was more of a discussion item for the group. And uh, the background to this is currently we do allow smoking post security in the airport in the courtyard area only. It's actually identified in the ordinance that there's no smoking in the concourses or in the terminal. However, you can smoke in the courtyard. The airport has been getting increasing complaints, um, particularly because of our growth and the congestion uh, in the area um, involving smoking and people being allergic and it's not healthy and all the other things that come with smoking. We are proposing to ban smoking uh, airport wide, uh, leading from the curbside um, all the way into the, the sterile area. Um, and that would include uh, smoking for employees, which currently uh, use the smoking areas on the ramp. Uh, we have concerns about that due to the chemicals and the equipment and things uh, that happen on the ramp side as well. Uh, we were hoping to get some feedback from the commission on uh, what they'd like to see in that policy, how we should proceed, and thoughts on that. So this is kind of an open dialogue situation. Uh, I heard about this. Policy. I personally don't want smoking. 
However, coming from an enforcement background, if you say no smoking from the sidewalk to the air side, uh, you have employees that will find a place to smoke. You will have passengers who will find a place to smoke. The air side of the airport is a dangerous place. And if, if you can control where they're going to smoke and enforce that, that that is where they smoke and it is safe, um, it, everybody's in a much better position than just say no smoking because they will find a place to smoke. Right. And, and we agree with you. Uh, there are a lot of airports that have uh, smoking rooms, post security. Unfortunately, we don't have the space for that here. Um, what a large number of airports are doing now are asking passengers if they need to smoke. Absolutely, you have to leave the sterile area and go outside, have your cigarette, and then be restrained to come back through the checkpoint. Uh, for employees, I'm not entirely sure how other airports are handling that. We'll have to ask around, um, but we would certainly identify an area uh, outside of the building where smokers would be able to have their cigarette. This also includes This would also include big buildings. Yes. Other comments or input? Chris, perhaps the only position in the room that would certainly support it from a public health perspective. Good to know. Are there any questions or comments online? Okay, so next steps is we're going to draft a policy internally, uh, run it by the city attorney, because I'm sure Jeremy wants to put his ink on it, um, mm -hmm. and then bring that back to the commission um, to review and hopefully vote on. Uh, that will likely include some type of signage, removal of ash trace, trace uh, post security, as well as an announcement throughout the facility, and of course, a public notice period for, for all of those things. Uh, or is there any possibility of looking, since, since I'm thinking public side, air side, and where the danger is uh, with hazardous material and fuel and that, that it could be split from passengers and employees or in a different category and that they are in a controlled area? We can take a look at that for sure. Um, I can tell you we're just running out of space, both the air side and in the terminal everywhere. Um, so it's going to be challenging, but we can take a look at it. Uh, any additional comments from anyone here in the meeting? Anyone on Zoom has any comments on this item? And Thank you. One, oh, yes, Commissioner. Do you want to explore smoking like a team or something? I'm sorry. Maybe maybe a machine would want to stop or something just to we're expecting the board to come in. So that's good, actually good feedback. So we'll take that back to MRG and see if they'd be willing to, to do that. Okay. We just want to one more time to sure somebody we're asking for public comments. Any other public comments? To say omitted public comments. Any public comments? Thank you. So what do we say? We're supporting the no, no, no smoking policy. Well, we should try to find a place for people to smoke. Is that where our recommendation is? Okay. This Okay. So is that designated for employees? So it can send as employees on the air side and for passengers on the house side of the terminal. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, That's the direction I got it. Okay. We all agree. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. All right. Let's move forward. Uh, All right, um, so my capital improvements project report is uh, in your packets. However, there's something that I wanted to highlight here, and that is so Jeremy and I have been working on um, adding parking capacity or trying to add parking capacity for the airport for quite a while. Uh, and one area that we need to navigate is what to do. Um, with some of the current activities on the airport. So for context and background, some of the commissioners were on the commission at the time, but two years ago, I briefed a transition plan to the airport, which included moving Uber and Lyft and taxis, limos, commercial vehicles to lot A, which would relieve all the traffic on the outer loop road. We would turn that into an arrivals loop uh, road or lane 
Um, and then the inner lane, uh, the closest to the Wexford terminal would be a departures lane. Um, with that, we would shift some of the public parking to the overflow lot, and there would in theory be a premium lot and then an economy lot uh, for the airport. Since that time, um, while we were trying to address employee parking, public parking, uh, ground transportation, rental car companies, we've been in this almost paralysis trying to solve a problem, multiple problems actually. The first being the rental car company capacity, um, particularly Avis, but some of the other car companies are growing their capacity here or their inventory here. Um, and we just completely run out of space um, for the rental cars to operate. Um, we're also challenged, obviously, meeting the employee parking need here. Um, and then during certain peaks, the public parking need here. And we still have roadway congestion on the roads. So CNS, who we hired to work on the parking study and the parking analysis for us, has been in a holding pattern while we try and figure out, go through the master plan process, and trying to solve the problem of what to do with lot A, what to do with public parking, the rental cars, et cetera. At this point, we want to move forward because we're, we have a need. So we've got two options here, um, and we're, the hope is to get feedback from the commission on those two options. And the first would be to turn lot A into a rental car ready lot, uh, which would, we would abandon that lot and shift that parking uh, over to the overflow lot that would become a dedicated and, uh, economy lot uh, for the airport. The idea is that we relieve some of that return traffic for the rental cars. Um, they're right now they're parking at State Hall, they're blocking roads. It's getting to be a nightmare. Um, option one only solves that particular problem. It does not solve the roadway congestion, does not solve uh, the walk to Uber and Lyft staging area uh, doesn't solve anything else. It just solves the rental car problem. Alternative two uh, for us here, or option two for us here, uh, is to move all commercial ground commercial vehicle activities to lot A, which would relieve traffic on the loop roads. Um, we would then take all the rental car return traffic, move that to the overflow lot in some capacity or ground transportation lot. Uh, which would decongest the rental cars. Um, it's not the perfect ideal situation. The rental cars are going to be challenged, uh, but we resolve or at least temporarily resolve a couple of problems, which is the rental car congestion, the congestion on the roadways, which is becoming more and more problematic as people are trying to navigate the roadways. Um, and then we would uh, shift some of the parking to the overflow lot and start operating that, that facility permanently. So. Um, we weren't able to get this onto the commission agenda for a vote. However, we would like feedback on how to proceed so that we can get CMS instructions on what the commission would like to see. And then we can define um, kind of guidelines from there. Um, Harry, with, with an option to what kind of sign would there be for um, drivers as they approach and give them enough opportunity to know if they're the arrival lane or the departure lane? Uh, so we are in the process right now. I don't know if you all have seen the uh, variable message signing as you're coming through the VIP area that's currently in operative. We're, we're replacing that now. Uh, and with the new signage, we would identify those lanes. Uh, so you would have your departures lane, your arrivals lane, and they have the ability to be switched based on the time of day. So what's your thought on that? To package this, um, with lots of detail and then bring it to the next meeting and see where the commission lands on this. Yes. It'd be helpful to have the graphics to see a whole bunch of visual. Yeah. It is the rental car problem and it's probably seasonal, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, quasi seasonal. <laughs> it's, getting, it's getting worse, but we see it more between February and May for sure. Yeah. So, Seems like option one be wasting a lot of space for a seasonal problem. Other issues. Um, one of the things that we're considering within this as well as the baggage claim expansion, whenever we get there, is we will have to move the rental cars anyway. Um, and so that transition would be made easier if they were already relocated in some fashion. Um, 
but sorting out where they go, that's that's the challenge here. Shooting for a time frame, would that be for next week? Yes, absolutely. So we're working right now on operational plans for next season uh, because we have a need to address some of these issues. So option B, moving the rental car lot to the old local parking place, we're going to need um, what's going to shut us. Would the car rental places be willing to share that expense since that's where the cars are? That's part of the reason that we charge the customer facility charge. Um, that actually supports not only the development and construction of Con uh, Rack, but it also supports shuttle services should we need it. So, yes, we would put them on the floor. So, essentially, this would be people would still um, interact with the car rental service agents for the new press up until that changes, and then all would be shuttled. To the overflow where rental cars would then reside? Uh, so, what that would look like if we, so in option A, if we kept the ready lot out here, um, we've got two options. We can leave the customer service desk in place. I can tell you that we are well over capacity when it comes to baggage claim right now. I was just downstairs a couple of days ago and people were complaining about the congestion there. So, we might want to consider abandoning that. Now, so for the real car desk or soon. Um, so, the idea would be to put trailers in lot A. You can go out and pick up your car or some kind of uh, structure in lot A so you can pick up your car there uh, or uh, move that activity to the overflow lot. So, people would go get on the shuttle right away and go to the overflow lots and do the big work and then get their car. Exactly. Gotcha. And what would happen if we're part of the now? That's there are a couple of different scenarios. So uh, we, in theory, we could move the entire world our operation over to the workflow lot. Um, my understanding is some people wouldn't like that. So we're trying to find a good balance here of keeping them near the terminal. Um, but we could do one of two things. We could have the return lanes over the overflow lot um, and direct passengers to return their cars there, shuttling them back to the terminal and it would be a circular route. Or uh, we could stage the entire operation over there and just they're immediately picked up here, shuttle over there. Um, the rental cars would be staged, the ready lots would be an overflowing GTC lots uh, with additional inventory and in what we currently have as the LA lot, which is on the side of the airfield. Um, and they have the rental car companies would have to figure out how to shuttle those cars back and forth. These are big implications because if we come up with plan B, maybe that just makes the contract decision a lot easier. You've already moved them over there, and that's where you're going to build it. I mean, people have been fighting that decision so far because we all had the thing priority of keeping it as a baggage plan. Uh, but it's a great big six story building, and we had concerns about that too. Anyway, so next meeting will come with the graphics and have more time to look at this. Yeah, um, our goal here was to get some feedback so to inform our thinking um, and get a sense for where the commission was, and then we can bring something back for the commission to really dial in on. Um, but you know, certainly the feedback has been helpful so far. So, any other comments on this? Any other comments on the executive report? Do we have any uh, public comments for the CIP report and projects report? Anyone in the room? Anyone on Zoom? Public comments? We have no public comments. Thank you. Um, executive Director, report any comments or questions on Harry's report? Harry, anything else you want to highlight in the report? Let me check. This being an Apollo, we're supposed to come out late. I don't believe there's anything I wanted to highlight, but I just think I'm going for this report. The only thing I think was he had a question about the situation with the navigation center. Ah, yes. Um, so we did get questions from one of the commissioners regarding the navigation center and its impact on uh, the airfield security, the airport security. If we've seen any, any uh, difference in house individuals mm -hmm. on the airport, we haven't. Um, 
it, it seems like a pretty seamless check-in process uh, across the way, and then uh, they're directed to the navigation center. So um, it's been a year since we implemented the ordinance for unhoused, uh, uh, unhoused folks on the airport. Our plan right now, unless you guys request otherwise, is just to uh, report only if we see a change. Sounds good. Sounds good. Can we move over to yeah, Commissioner? Sure. Yeah. Commissioner Nicolas, any comments, Commissioner Nicolas? No more. No more. We're done. <laughs> just um, like two things. One is um, I know we, we have plans for the measure J line. The shady structure will go up this summer. Correct. Not measure J related, but that's the one that's already in the works for the TSA coming out of the TSA in nine cities. That's going to go up in the summer. So the measure J was approved by those funds were approved by city council, correct? With the three recommendations came to the yes, mission. They were approved. Um, any updates on when? Uh, we're trying to work that into our work plans now. Honestly, we have been slammed 360 these last few months. However, what you're likely to see happen first uh, are two things. Uh, to put the carpet in the ticketing lobby and lead into the baggage claim. Uh, I know maintenance has been working on that in the background for the last couple of weeks. Uh, and then the replacement of the water going It's with water going station has been working on getting special things. So it's not going to be immediately, but you'll probably see that sometime over the summer with both of those activities. We'll see an update next week, next uh, meeting. Well, I know David wanted to bring that back to the Oscar committee as well and talk about it. So maybe he does that at that meeting first and then we determine. He can provide an update at the commission. He can provide an update at the commission meeting. Yeah. All right. I think, you know, it's just logistically, you have to combine them with this mental car displacement, ground transportation thing, because if we put shade structures where the transport is now, will be useless to us if we're going to move. Absolutely. But you know, the chairs and the furniture piece, I mean, we submitted the source of where that comes from. So that and uh, the water balance, I'm glad to see that's moving forward. If we just get an update to make sure this stuff is moving forward, that would be great. Um, I want to draw your attention to one other thing. Um, there's a subcommittee that's been looking at the designs, potential designs for the Agricati and the concourse. We have some really constructive discussions and looking at the first phase of what they're thinking of. And I just want to draw your attention to this thing on page nine where it says, <laughs> with the Agua County and Casinos properties, for now, as a premier global entertainment hub, this partnership promises to elevate the airport experience for travelers from the moment they arrive. Um, in, our, in our meeting, our subcommittee meeting, um, I think we saw that the, most of the suggestions were um, visual. And we had suggested that if the tribe is going to make this promise to really change the experience, that we include things like setting in the work tables, trying to get a web trip to these work tables to, so that the experience is not just visual, but there's some upgrade in terms of this. So when I saw this, Jeremy, I thought, if that is the promise, I hope that we're really pushing on this. I know that it was beyond the scope perhaps initially, but you said we would look at bringing electricity in and try to workstations or something else that would improve the experience that we were hoping to get you know, across the airport. Some challenges around access to electric and things like this in the regional terminal already. So just, it, I'm not sure we'll be ready to show the full permission of what the plans are by that time, but. Um, we mentioned it, and that's going to reinforce that we're talking about experience here. That would really be helpful. It's really going to change the experience above and beyond, beyond what they're doing. Let's look at Harry's, Harry's court, not, not mine. But. Yeah, so we're working on that with, with Fuse and with I would call Ann and Kennedy Nimbus. Um, and I know Daniel's been working on that. Uh, he obviously isn't here to speak to that. Uh, but we understand the mission here is to improve, improve the experience and we're working toward that. Good. So that's what we'll be looking for. More than just enterprise car wash sound and that's a story. Are there any other commission requests or um, I just have an observation that the getting area I noticed that uh, Mr. Mon 
problem, which was amazing and so nice to have flow. That uh, a few chairs that were designated for uh, passengers were waiting for a wheelchair are now up in there. So, is there any plan of putting them back? I'm sorry, this is at what area? In the beginning area, for example, like United, Delta, there used to be uh, chairs for passengers who are waiting for a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. After checking in, they wait there until their wheelchair is gone. So, they can basically. So, we remove them from in front of those ticket counters because we installed some storage space for the airlines because it was badly needed. There are some chairs in front of Alaska, Alaska and some in front of Southwest of Alo and Flair. Um, if there's an opportunity to add any, we'll see if we can do that. There are certain times of the day where we're still congested down there that I can't see that working too well for us, but we'll, we'll look at it. And this is probably applied in your earlier comments, but just as we do think about uh, where a real car ready may be positioned, particularly if it does take out some or substantial part of what we're working um, I mean, the rare of feedback I get representing my study usually is related to parking. Uh, and so that we, we really are comprehensively thinking about how those flow changes will impact parking and how we can best respond to them. When the design was presented to the city council, one of the biggest questions was, well, what about the traffic? If we move forward with 1A, what about the traffic? And I know that Brian said at the time, that's in the next phase to look at overall traffic. Now we put this development into that study too. I think we have to look at the council's effectiveness so over the overall traffic impact and how this thing, what the impact would be, would be moving forward for the economic growth. So that's kind of the next uh, long term management as well. Christina, is there anything else? No, sir. Okay, we're good. All right, our next airport meeting is on April 17th. We've recommended a series of things we'll add on to the uh, to the agenda. Um, any final comments or thoughts? Um, thank you for your patience. I um, you know next time we'll start earlier. We just turn it after twenty after. Unfortunately, the Zoom account was it was the, it was the Zoom account itself was closed. It was a Zoom issue, so we get no way of knowing ahead of time. Well, if we try to open up and do our channel check ahead of time, but that was nothing we would have expected at all to happen. These kind of miracles. Hey, we'll fix it for next time. Thank you all for your time. Thanks for all your effort. Thank you for all of you on Zoom. We'll see you next time.